All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this afternoon with our Homelands History Series, where we are going to be giving you a awesome virtual tour of the Mission House located in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Um, if you have questions while this tour is going on, place them in the comments below. We will be monitoring them live for you and answering any questions that you have live while the uh, tour is going on. What I am gonna do now, because I'm sitting here in Wisconsin, I'm gonna throw it over to Bonnie Hartley, our Historic Preservation Manager, who is going to take it from there in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Hi, Bonnie. Hi, everyone. What a month day. Uh, welcome everybody to our live tour of the Stockbridge Mission House in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. It's a beautiful spring afternoon and we want you to imagine as if you're here with us today and that we're all on a tour together. I'm really fortunate to be able to have a special kind of behind the scenes tour in the Mission House and then we're going to follow it next door with a view in the nearby carriage house um, and show some of our items that we're working really hard to repatriate back to our community. So for those in our community or the people who are visiting today, for the first time, I just wanted to also um, introduce a little bit about some background to what we're doing today. So the Mission House, uh, it relates to the missionary tour tribe in the 1700s, John Sargent, um, and it is a, a standing building that still exists from our time here. Um, and it represents our colonial mission era experience. Um, and it's the only place that we can still go into where um, that's open to the public where our tribe, we know, you know, was present before and when you kind of go into it today, the only thing we can't quite convey in a virtual tour is the feeling that you get when you go in, you know, which is still uh, very powerful, you know, you still kind of feel uh, just sent right back to that moment in time. Um, I also wanted to just share that, to be clear that our tribe is not solely from Stockbridge, you know, this isn't where we came from originally only our territory is much more vast. We're from the Mahikanatuk or Hudson River Valley and the Housatonic River Valleys. Um, this is just, you know, one piece of our homelands, but it became a very central part of our history um, in the mid 1700s when we moved here. And there was a vote in 1734 um, by council fire of our sachems deliberating over whether or not to make this major move from our place of the council fire at Skodak Island, an island in the Mahikanatuk or Hudson River Valley. Um, and to, if we wanted to decide to move the council fire here to Stockbridge and all that comes with it, you know, all the kind of, um, you know, detrimental effects that could have as well. So our tribe eventually, not unanimously, but voted to come, decided to, you know, come to Stockbridge and accept a missionary whose house we're visiting um, and to, co-govern the town of Stockbridge, which is called Indian Town, um, and we would be governing it alongside four English families. So it's kind of an experiment to see uh, if that was possible uh, to, to carry that out. So we're gonna today have this awesome opportunity. Um, imagine as if you're here on a regular homeland trip that we used to be able to take um, and come with us today on a tour inside. Uh, Mark Wilson is the curator of the Mission House, so he's going to be our tour guide. Hey everyone, um, welcome to the Mission House. I, I work with the Trustees of Reservations who owns this property now, but work very hard to bring forward this just amazing history um, here in Stockbridge and uh, working closely with the tribe. And we'll see some of the what we're experiencing more recently, but should we go on inside and start yeah. there? And as Heather had said, please um, put any comments that you have in the comments below on Facebook, and I'm going to be monitoring those and passing those on to Mark. Thanks. So the first room coming in here, this back part of the house, the house itself was built about 1740-1741. So it's a few years after the, um, the town was formed. And uh, John Sargent, who was a minister, he studied at Yale College, came up to the area in the early 1730s, built this house. Uh, he married Abigail Williams, later Abigail White, um, following Sargent's death. But the house itself, um, pretty much intact from the Sargent's time. This room, uh, by tradition, was Sargent's office space. And you can see on the display case here, we have 
a few pieces from the collection uh, related to uh, the basket, uh, Mohican basket up top, a powder horn from the 1750s inscribed by John Chickens, and the conch shell, um, the sounding horn um, related to metoxin, and there's some other history to it. Doing some research with Bonnie um, on these pieces right now. And we've turned this into a space, and when we get into the other room, you can um, see it all. The in museum outside has been um, transformed, and we're going to talk about how that space is going to be used. But in here, we really tried to bring more of the Mohican history into when people first come into the house. So not only do you feel that the presence and the history of this place and the importance of the place, but the panels that are here and along the hallway that help introduce um, the story that's so important to us. Want to the next row? Yeah. Good night. This is the first tour of the season for me. So <laughs> we just had snow on the ground last week. So it's nice to have the sunshine and um, the warmth. But the house itself is basically two rooms on each floor, plus this little small room that we first went into. And for the sergeants, um, it, this would have been a, a communal parlor. It would have been a space in the 1740s for meetings and gatherings. It probably would have been a sleeping chamber too, because houses like this had multiple uses for all the rooms. And this is a good place to introduce uh, some of the history of how the house got here because it was originally about a mile from here when it was built in the 1740s. And then by the 19, 1860s, the Sargent family sold the house and moved away. A few items from the Sargent family stayed in the house. And a woman named Mabel Choate, who had a home across the street from where this building originally stood, saw the house. It was not being used. There was an opportunity for her to buy it. And her goal was to create the museum. But she couldn't get the land that the house was sitting on. So she owned this little corner of Main Street. Um, we know from the deeds and the research that's been done, uh, the Macon family who lived here, we know uh, for, Lot next door was the site of the first school set up in Stockbridge. And John Sargent's original home from the 1730s when he first moved to Stockbridge was on a site on the lot next door. So the house actually comes back to the center of uh, life in the 1730s, 1740s for Stockbridge. By Mabel Cho, she had the building restored on the site, had the outbuildings created, the gardens put in, and she acquired a few pieces to bring back to the house. One of the most important is this, what's called either um, a dresser or desk. And we know it came from New Haven. It came up with John Sargent when he finished his studies at Yale and became the minister here in Stockbridge. Uh, it has panels, these slides, so books and papers could be placed in there. And the top's the dump. So the whole piece is more of a, a traveling piece. And for a minister like Sargent who figured probably in his lifetime, he was gonna be moving around a lot. Instead, he comes to Stockbridge and spends uh, the remaining 15 years of his life here. But it was an important piece for Sargent. There's one other that was owned and made for Jonathan Edwards, the next minister who comes to town after Sargent's death in 1749. And then this room, you see there's some very formal paneling. After Sargent's death in 1749, Abigail, uh, his wife, she remarries. Uh, General Dwight. Following the death of her second husband, she moved back into the house with her son Erastus and his family who lived on one half and Abigail had this half. So it was almost like the house was divided into two parts and Abigail spent the remaining years of her life um, on this side of the building. So there we, that's a pretty okay. good description of this room. Go. So far, no questions. So let's keep going. <laughs> And a lot of what you see in the house here, it's all collected by Mabel Cho. So during those years from the 1928 to 1933, up through the 1930s, she's collecting objects and furniture. There are seven pieces like this, uh, the dresser, chest, uh, some chairs that belong to the sergeants. The remaining pieces uh, she purchased to fill the house out. Thank you. 
we go to this side of the house, which is the kitchen, uh, cooking area, uh, communal life in here. There would have been not only the cooking, but spinning and weaving and candle making, uh, dining, um, food preparation. There's uh, the red oven on the side of the fireplace here. So once or twice a week, they're firing the red oven to do cooking, pies, breads, um, making uh, stews. A lot of furniture in here, and there's probably more here than would have been here during the sergeant's time or any of the families to follow. And again, that's Mabel Choate's collecting to, to fill the house out um, from objects that date to the 18th and into the 19th centuries. But in preserving the house, she brought it down and had it reassembled as it was by the time she acquired it in the 1920s. But even before then, there were a lot of changes being made to the house. Room walls were being moved. Uh, there's a door that became um, a solid wall. So they're you know, reorienting things over time. And then in its later um, history, as it was for the museum in the 19, we acquired the building in 1948. That's when Mabel Cho um, donated the building to the trustees. And then in the 1970s, uh, Norman Rockwell, uh, the painter and illustrator who lived here in Stockbridge from uh, the 1950s until his death in 1978, used this room. And uh, what Sasha sort of, she pans around, um, heading uh, back to the fireplace. And Bonnie's got an image of the last painting um, done by Norman Rockwell. And he lived a couple of blocks from here. Uh, he would drive over on a Sunday and uh, spend some time here in the afternoon when the house was empty and do his sketches and take some photographs. And it's a representation of John Sargent on the left-hand side, my left, and uh, Kunkapot on the right-hand side. And you can see some of the furniture still here. The fireplace is still here. And this is the painting that was on Rockwell's easel when he died. So uh, fitting tribute. Yeah, I know. Um my own grandmother, but um, a lot of other community members of ours, um, I know were really highlight in life was to be able to meet him, um, mm -hmm. Norman Rockwell, wow. and his visit his studio, and you know, were well received by him. Um, yeah. But I guess also about the painting though, I just wanted to share that I know, um, at least oral tradition in our community has been, I haven't seen anything written as yet, but um, oral tradition has been that, uh, you know, told that we, Tribal members were not wouldn't have been able to stand here actually. So like the, you know how the painting depicts being here yeah. by the fireplace that there was only like a a side um, entrance to yeah. come in. Um, I haven't again seen references to that in writing, but maybe that's not something people would have wanted to <laughs> record. I'm not sure. No, and you know sort of there's these two doors in the back part of the house. So I think the tradition started in even in the modern times interpreting the house that those were the doors that. Anybody from the tribe would go in there to meet with sergeants. There's really no factual evidence. It's never been written that way. And this house, you think about it, it's 1740. There's a very few people living out here. And there were most likely Stockbridge when who helped to build, they would have been probably helping to fell the timbers. So everything about this house relates, it's interconnected um, with not only the English colonists, but the, 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 the tribe. Mm -hmm who are um, involved in daily life um, throughout this community. All right, I wanted to, um, so far I don't see questions, but I'll keep checking. So definitely if you have any questions about this room in particular, the house, um, our history in Stockbridge, the, you know, mission time, um, you know, definitely put them in, we'll, we'll get to them. But I guess Mark, since we were um, in here, I just thought of, I wanted to, if you could share with our community to, um, you know, when you are describing Mabel Cho and her strong interest in yeah. in this house and preservation and moving the house here. I mean, can you give any insight from your understanding of what she saw? You know, why would she would do that, or what was her motivation, as far as you know, at that time? Sure. So for Mabel, she was um, single, never married. She traveled the world. Her family, her, her father, had been a lawyer. Uh, the house they had here in Stockbridge was their summer home. They lived in New York City in the wintertime. But Stockbridge really became her home. She loved this town. She collected papers and books from the 18th and 19th century related to the history of the town and the history of this building. 
Um, she was a collector. She was a, a philanthropist. She was a very generous donor to cultural sites around this area. And she literally could see this building when it was on its original foundation from that summer home that just looking out the window and she saw it falling into disrepair. Uh, she had friends in her community who were preserving and collecting. So her goal became, I, I wanna save this building. Uh, she did it with a couple other buildings here in town, but this one, she wanted to open it to the public and to really be able to show the history of Stockbridge, uh, the Bohican history and the history of the sergeant. And, um, and sort of you know, bring that forward and, and keep it moving forward. And in 1933, she begins working with Ruth Gaines, who is the librarian for uh, the Museum of the American Indian in New York City, the Hay Foundation. And she contacts um, Ms. Gaines. And through her, that is when she acquires, uh, we now have 34 individual objects from the Stockbridge community in Wisconsin that Ruth Gaines purchased for Mabel to go here. And it really wasn't the original intent to have a separate um, Mohican Museum or History Museum, but as this building came together in Mabel's work, she then got the idea, let's create a museum. So those objects come in, they've been here since 1937. Mm -hmm. um, and we've acquired a few more, a few donations. So it's actually, 36 objects that we have in our collection here related to the Americans. But that touches a little bit on Mabel. I mean, she was an amazing character, um, funny, fun-loving, everybody in town really appreciated all the work that she was doing. And in some ways she did preserve this piece of Stockbridge history, Stockbridge Mohican community's history um, that's still with us today and we're working closely to um, repatriate many of these objects so let's yeah and we're going to take a look at some of them yeah. yeah i think we can head over if you want to just share sure head so, us out and show that they're yeah. in the upstairs but there is yeah. um the second and actually a third floor uh, there are three bedrooms upstairs um they are um uh, two larger rooms like the ones downstairs and a little chamber in the back we've got this big you know you think of a house in 1740 um, very um, isolated community out here in Stockbridge. This is a fairly formal house for the time period. And I do have a few questions. Oh, great. Um, Mark, during times, non-COVID, um, normal times, is when is the Mission House open for tours? We're going to be open. We open again in July, so July 1st, um, and we'll be open. Um, we're open definitely on the weekends. We're kind of seeing how COVID is playing out, but we're um, always open on the weekends and we may extend those days out. Um, because of the small rooms, we tried opening last year, but there wasn't enough room for protocols. Mm -hmm. But starting July 1st this year, we'll be open for tours. Okay. And always call first if you ever, if you're in town and it's not a weekend, um, we can always get the house open too. Great. Yeah. And then I guess kind of back to um, talking about the Norman Rockwell painting and uh -huh. Sergeant. Um, could you just describe maybe a little bit more about Sarge's relationship with our tribe or interaction? Sure. Help people picture. To help to understand that. So in 17, it's at least the fall of 1733, Sargent is still a student at Yale. He's studying theology and he's invited up by the English um, as the community is starting to form and this idea is formulating around creating Indian town. And he is asked to be the minister for this new uh, community, but he still has to go and finish his studies. He, he doesn't graduate until 1734 from Yale, where he was a valedictorian of his class and very well placed in, in uh, the college community. But at the same time as he goes back, the children, the sons of Umpachene and Konkapot, spend time with Sargent at Yale. Um, so that's He's learning some Mohican from the start. I think one of the things I found in understanding Sargent, even though there would have been, and he wrote in his journals that he didn't really understand the Stockbridge Mohicans. It was his first real introduction to a native community. Okay. And just kind of, he doesn't, he's not really positive all the time, but he really wants to understand and he's learning the language and he becomes um, the leader in many ways. I think for the 10 years, that he's here from the 1730s until his death in 1749. He is 
the best conduit between the English and representing the needs of the tribe and, and, and integrating the two communities. You definitely see that after his, you know, early passing, mm -hmm. that um, the theft of the land and dispossession here definitely, you know, the pace of that set up after it's, his passing. When you yeah. think of, I mean, in terms of years, it's like within 30 years from 1750 to 1785, all the land is displaced. Yeah, stuff our service in the war as well and coming back, yeah. and a lot of land to be taken and, yeah. you know, taking the land for collateral as for debts. Of these for debts years. that yeah. really wouldn't have been you know, there. And so should we head yeah, out to- Yeah, uh, right. on our way, there's a question about the painting in the first room. Uh, like the wall um, color or? I think the, uh, George the second. He's right here. We've got the four seasons. Uh, the picture still... in the first room, maybe. So there's George the second right here by the window. Uh, the English king, he would have been king in the 1730s when the community was formed and the um, colony of Massachusetts under Governor Jonathan Belcher uh, signs the Documents that create the incorporate Starfish. Is that the one? I'm not sure. You talk about the picture in the first room. There's that oh, one. Oh, let's in. maybe the first room back here. Okay. First person. There's the panel. That's part of the effort that. Mark was describing about the trustees' effort to integrate the story even more and work with our tribe on telling our story in the house. Because it really was just five years ago that the collection, the Stockbridge making collection, was in the building outside that we were going to go visit. But it was a meeting with the tribal leadership here where the question came up with why is the Stockbridge? separate from mm -hmm. the house. And that's really when all of this started to come together in the past five years. But there's this little drawing of the Mission House and its original foundation, oh, original okay. location, maybe that's the one. And then maybe I'll just see, but there's a Dutch map here from the 17th century, um, early 18th century, that shows um, Mohican representation of a Mohican village right up in the corner there. And it's dark and it's reflective. And maybe it, you might want to mention too that the Bibles, the story that they were originally here. Yeah. So this is the room. So for anybody who's who's seen and um, the Bibles that are uh, in, in, now, now. in the uh -huh. tribal museum now, um, they stood, they were in a case right here okay. where these two chairs and this little desk, they were right here. Um, so when you came in, when you're a visitor to the house, the two Bibles um, sat here until uh, they were recognized on visits in the 1970s, I believe, is when it first the first um, gets raised that why are these objects here, and then they're repatriated in 1989. Actually, repatriated before NAGPRA and the official um, acting um, presidential park service. So, and then we're yeah. gonna Go head next door. Yeah, talk more about repatriation. Great. Uh, so Mark was mentioning. For years, um, most of the Mexican materials were stored here in this building, which is now referred to as the Carriage House building. Um, and this is for the, the time it was called Indian Museum. You can maybe see on the door. On that side. Yeah, and so this was a separate um, space for a lot of really important items for our community. Um, and several of those items are now on display at our R.V.D. Miller Library Museum in Wisconsin. We're going to go on in. And um, we wanted to show to our community members to give a sense of what the space looks like, um, the kind of size of it, and just give you a visual of it because um, Stockbridge Monthly Community and the trustees have really significantly signed an agreement for the use of this space for at least the next five years. Uh, for our tribe to tell our story and, you know, interpret our history, have programming or, you know, whatever other um, things we would want to do in this space, but it's completely 
up to us. So our cultural affairs department is working on plans to uh, open an exhibit this summer, um, slated for July 1st, and tell our story, you know, in our own way in this room. So I just wanted to kind of show people that and hopefully have a chance, you know, to come out um, at some point, but we will have it for the next several years. Okay, so the exhibit that was in here was done around the time that the Bibles were repatriated in 1989-1990, and that's what we dismantled um, starting five years ago, moving some objects into the house. Uh, some are uh, in Wisconsin on the reservation today at the Miller Museum. Uh, and then this year, uh, working with Bonnie, we received a petition from the Stockbridge community to repatriate under cultural matrimony objects related to John Finney. And then in our research, also Austin Finney, uh, Sachems. So we're going to have a chance to show um, everybody watching some of these items up close here. I'm going to try to at least. So, um, so yeah, as Mark was saying, so I, um, I'm our repatriation representative for a tribe now. And so I've been, uh, we work together on this claim and we wanted to show a few of these items today. So these are all family heirlooms um, of our tribe that are from the Quinney family. So many of our tribal members are direct descendant of the Quinnacons or Quinney family in Stockbridge. And um, these, these current items we're gonna show right now are all ones where we, we've worked together to formally do the research and submit a claim under the Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act, NAGPRA law. And all of these items, the basis for that claim was as items of cultural patrimony, meaning that they belong to the collective um, because of Bukwini's you know, role as a sachem that they belong to all of us. And they're not you know, one individual piece of artwork or something like that, but that they represent um, you know, political symbol of leadership that represents our whole nation. So we're really grateful you know, for the trustees for um, you know, being so supportive in our claim. And as we just were talking today, it's the status of that claim. Do you wanna sure. share? So it's been a process of um, working with the National Park Service and with you, Bonnie, to submit uh, the notification and actually just today we got an email from the national park service saying that our notification is complete and it'll be posted within the next 30 days in the national register and um, after 30 days of posting um the objects will be cleared to be go back home yeah yeah that's awesome yeah. so that we're probably you know soon by the summer that will be incredible. coming home so can you see these okay so this is one of the items that's part of the NAGPRA claim that we can anticipate soon returning home to our people. Um, this is a magnifying glass of John Quinney's. And I believe the history and all on these items uh, that I'm showing are all through his daughter-in-law, Phoebe Quinney. Um, this is a pipe bowl of Austin Quinney that we're also repatriating under the same criteria as cultural patrimony because of his role as a state jump. Um, this is a sleigh bell attributed to John Pliny. And, you know, did some research on these um, as well to be able to show that these are kind of a pretty well-known trade item of that time uh, that would generally be given to to diplomats such as John Quinney. So again, it's representative of a leadership position. This item is a pipe stem of belonging to John Quinney. With inlay of, I, of There's, um, ivory. There's mother, mother of pearl. Yes, Michelle inlay on rosewood. It's a really beautiful piece in the silver bands on it. Um, the other item that we don't have here because it's in our Arvidi Miller Library Museum is um, John Quinney's leggings or leather leggings. Um, and those are currently on loan to our museum, but those are also part of the uh, NAG proclaim. And so, you know, we'll be staying in our museum. And then the last item we wanted to show that's part of the current repatriation effort is this um, cane belonging to John Quinney. And the cane, it was given to him by a Choctaw Nation chief. 
So again, it was given to him because of his role as a sachem in our community and representing his leadership position. Um, and this cane pulls out into a sword. So it's a really special piece. Here's the sword piece. So all of these items are subject to the NAG proclaim under cultural patrimony to Stockbridge Muncie Mohican Nation. And we're at this point, like Mark said, waiting on the um, you know the process to go through to complete. And then we you know sincerely look forward to bringing them back home. And uh, in addition to these items that are under the NAG proclaim, um, you know we've also been in discussion about many of the other items um, that are in their Mohican collection at the Mission House and possibly the opportunity to voluntarily right. uh, transfer those to a community um, if they don't meet the federal criteria necessarily of the law, but just working together to, to transfer them mm -hmm. anyway to our community where they came from and where they belong. Um, and I wanted to also just mention with the, when uh, Mark was describing about some of the history of most of these items kind of generally coming from late 1920s, early 1930s in our community, um, that that's really significant to us too, as we work together in considering kind of the right thing to do or, you know, the ethics of the objects, because all those, that time period for us was, um, you know, when our tribe was often, you know, more in a precarious position, you know, lands being stripped and a lot of, you know, homeless, landless community at the time. So um, it was just, you know, really challenging time. And so it was during that time that a lot of these items were acquired by the buyer. So it, we're grateful that they ended up to be preserved all this time. But at the same time, you know, the manner in which they were, they were acquired at the time was, um, you know, when a lot of people had no other option, you know, other than to, um, to hand them over and maybe hope that they would have been, you know, preserved here before we had a tribal archive in place. Right. So it's something that we, you know, are grateful that the trustees is also considering that in terms of voluntary return. And that they had survived 150 years of removal yeah, across the country. Maybe. And um, and they're still with us and going, as you said, going back home, which is so important for us. At the same time, too, it's worth mentioning Monument Mountain, um, which mm -hmm. is about five miles south of here. Oh, you're going to finish on that step yeah, check sure. That. So Monument Mountain, an important uh, site for the Stockbridge Mohican uh, tribal community. It is uh, a few miles south of here. It's a uh, large, it rises about 600 feet, uh, this big stone um, mountain. And we've worked closely with Bonnie and the tribal leadership to rename um, Monument Mountain and to rename some of the trails. Um, and so that's all happening. And, and I mean, it's an exciting time for us because you know, we know for a while issues around um, just the site itself and to bring forward the Mohican story is like here, it, it's, it's the heart of what this place is. And it's important to us that those stories come forward. So, yeah, it seems like the trustees and our community have always had, you know, a long standing relationship mm -hmm. in many ways. So, definitely the Mission House. Um, and all of you know, our cultural heritage items, but all of you know, a lot of the other properties in this area and the Berkshires are very significant. So, as I sure. mentioned, Sacred Site at Monument Mountain. Um, so, it's, it's really great to be able to work with you and be at this point where you know the relationship is, is so positive and yeah. it's really appreciated. Yeah, it's so exciting for us to, to have all of this happen. Yeah. Um, I think we're set. I just checked comments, and the other one I saw was just if you could. Um, repeat for someone who missed it where the mission house originally was located before it was moved. Sure. So when Stockbridge was set up, and I, I think the, I'm going to get this math right, the, the acreage that's here between Stockbridge and West Stockbridge is about the same amount of acreage that is the reservation in Wisconsin. That's right. Like 23, uh -huh. 24,000 mm -hmm. acres. So it's the community size about the same, which was divided off and Lots were set up here along Main Street, mainly um, Stockbridge Mohican families living on the lots along Main Street. And Sargent, whose house this was, was on the hillside about a mile from here. And it was a much larger lot. It was probably three to four or five times the amount of acreage that he had there. But it's just about a mile. It's on the hill um, overlooking town, Prospect Hill. Um, and it's the site can still be visited today. 
it is open to the public mm -hmm. to, um, and it's marked. So I want to visit here to be able to see it. And it's right across the street from Mount Peg, which was Middle Chill's summer home. So we, I mean, we do know from research, especially courtesy of Rick Wilcox and all of his dedicated research of our um, sites along Main Street. So we would know, you know, our Mohican ancestors, um, you know, who lived here, where the Mission House is currently located, um, before, the, you know, the house was moved here. So it was right. originally Mohican ancestors land here. Exactly. At that time. Yeah. So I guess we can just head back out and then we'll sure. sign up. This is your last view here at the Mission House. I'm so glad for everyone joining, and um, we really hope to keep bringing you more virtual tours of our homelands. That's the second best thing to being here. So we hope everyone stays well. Let's pitch Kanae well. We'll see you next time. Bye.